Oh, kia ora koutou katoa and welcome to this afternoon's briefing. Uh, I'm pleased to report that today there are no new cases of COVID-19 in New Zealand. So our total number of cases remains at 1,153. That's confirmed cases and the total confirmed and probable at 1,503. Another five cases have been categorised as recovered and that then brings the total to 1,452, which is 97% of all cases. There are no additional deaths to report, and today there is just one person in hospital still in Middlemore Hospital and not requiring intensive care. Yesterday, our labs processed 6,113 tests. Our grand total now is 244,838 completed. I want to give a reminder today about uh, flu vaccines and to encourage Kiwis to get their vaccine, uh, especially as the weather noticeably starts to get a bit colder. Uh, you'll recall that uh, this year we had ordered, ordered a record number of 1.76 million uh, vaccines of the Southern Hemisphere vaccine, and that's now been open for everyone to uh, be able to get vaccinated for the last uh, two and a half weeks. Uh, we are still asking our immunisation providers, though, to just keep back some of that vaccine for our high needs groups who may need it over coming months, for example, pregnant women. Uh, we have also, I'm pleased to say, uh, secured uh, with Pharmac an extra 360,000 doses of the Northern Hemisphere vaccine, which were available. Those have arrived in the country. They have passed through the regulatory process and have been approved for use in healthy people aged three to 64. Now this vaccine is not quite the same for um, uh, components as the Southern Hemisphere vaccine. It's an absolute match for two of the four components, provides uh, some partial protection for a third and the other strain of virus uh, that is in it is not uh, a match for the existing Southern Hemisphere vaccine. However, the advice has been very clear from our experts that this would, uh, using this vaccine would afford useful protection to Kiwis and that will now be available to be used once the uh, supplies of our Southern Hemisphere vaccine have been uh, all um, given to people. So that uh, vaccine, as I say, is available and for order uh, from this week and uh, I would encourage Kiwis again to go out and get the flu jab. Uh, and that will mean we'll have a total of around 2.1 million doses of flu vaccine available to be used this winter. It is of much more value in people's arms than it is sitting on the shelf, so please do go out and get your flu jab. Just a, a comment on funerals and tangihanga. Uh, since we moved to Alert Level 2 just over a week ago, uh, funeral directors have been able to register funerals and tangihanga to enable uh, uh, groups of up to 50 to participate uh, if they can confirm that they've got uh, public health precautions in place. And I'm pleased to say that since the start of Alert Level 2, around 650 uh, funerals in Tangiha uh, have been registered. Some of these will be uh, relate to the same event because they, there may be a registration for a service at a church and also one at a crematorium. But I'm really pleased to see that that system has been working very well and enabling uh, families and friends to get together and grieve for lost family members. An update on the New Zealand uh, COVID Tracer app. We continue to be encouraged by the number of Kiwis who've reg registered as at midday today, 236,000 registrations for the app. Uh, so if people haven't downloaded it, I continue to encourage you to do so. Uh, it will help us uh, in our overall efforts to contact you quickly if we need to. So not noting that identifying, tracing and isolating contacts is a really quickly is a very key part of our overall effort. Uh, businesses are going through the process of uh, uh, getting their QR code and to date uh, 6,500 QR codes have been generated by businesses. I understand yesterday some people with some phone models had trouble locate, or, well some people had trouble locating the app in the Google Play Store. We've worked with Google to make sure it is much more obvious and can be found more easily and also there were some uh, phone users who had trouble either downloading the app or registering. We've already done updates to try and fix any bugs that were there and this is something that of course happens uh, when uh, a new app is made available. We uh, did some user testing beforehand, but of course the app wasn't tried on every single model of phone, but we are addressing those issues as they arise. And also today we've published uh, draft uh, standards and the related 
specifications for developers of other apps who will then, if they use those standards and specifications, be able to have their app use that single New Zealand business number related QR code. So there will be uh, only then a need for businesses or uh, present, um, premises to display that single QR code that is related to the unique New Zealand business number. And just to confirm uh, a word on privacy, you, the personal information that people provide when they register with the app is held only in the Ministry of Health, only for contact tracing, and any other data is held only on your phone, and you release it uh, if requested, and if you wish to, if you are contacted. On a final note, as you'll be aware, uh, bars and pubs reopen today under Alert Level 2. Uh, mind you, while we remain in Alert Level 2, they do so under the same uh, requirements that are already in place for hospitality venues, that is to protect uh, everybody's health and, c and make sure we are not compromising the gains we have already made with COVID-19. So that includes, of course, uh, limiting physical interaction between patrons from different groups uh, and, of course, between staff and customers. It will be uh, a great chance to catch up with a friend and support your local business. Uh, so uh, this may not, however, be the time to publicly try out any new dance moves you have learned over the lockdown. Um, so do have fun if you're heading out to a bar or pub in coming days, but do support the staff by ensuring that you are, uh, do so from your seat and you're within your small group. And just finally, a word on the contact details that you will be or, or already being asked to provide when you visit a hospitality venue. Uh, please ensure you give the correct details. The whole purpose of this is to ensure that you can be contacted to protect your health and, of course, the health of your family and the wider community, should it be necessary. I'm open to questions. How well, many well, people have downloaded the app since yesterday? Uh, so, since well, there are 236,000 registrations total, and I think when I spoke yesterday it was around 90,000, so that's about another 146,000 if my maths is correct. How many people do you want to uh, be using that app for it to be really successful? as many as possible. And just a word on that, uh, I know there's been some articles about the limited functionality of the app at the moment, and I agree. However, even by registering, even by registering, that means that we have up-to-date contact details for people who have registered that we can use. So that is of benefit to every individual who has already downloaded the app. The QR code functionality will be of increasing value, and of course we are adding further functionality over coming weeks to make sure that it, the app is of I, I, even more value to individuals but also to businesses which will mean then they won't need to continue to record people's details. Half a, mil a, half a mil million businesses in New Zealand, only 6,000 have actually got those QR codes. Are you disappointed by the take up? Uh, not as yet, no, I think it's, uh, it's good progress. Uh, there is a bit of a process they need to go through. Of course not all businesses are open at the moment. Um, but I'll just equally encourage businesses to go through that process, download the, the QR code and display it, um, and uh, that will help uh, both you and, and other Kiwis. Why did, you, um, why did you decide to design your own bespoke solution for this app, and did you consider acquiring any existing apps, uh, buying the rights wholesale for them, or buying the companies associated with them? Yes, we, uh, we didn't consider buying any companies. However, we did consider the full range of options here, uh, and we were looking to see what other countries were doing. And I, I can say that we had many, many offers of solutions. Uh, however, we did decide to go down the, um, the route of developing our own app, because then we could be confident about what, um, what information was being collected, what was being done with that information, and of course it allowed us to then develop and add further functionalities uh, once people had downloaded that app. And I know there's also been uh, some commentary that it's taken a long time. I dare say when a government agency develops an app, it is not the same as a private uh, app um, uh, provider. We uh, have to go through a very thorough process, of course, particularly uh, around privacy issues, ensuring it, it links with other government uh, priorities and um, approaches, and of course, in this case, uh, getting cabinet approval to go ahead with an app like this, which was very important. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a good solution and it will be even more useful as we go ahead. And does it, it only works with some versions of Android and some versions of iOS at some stage, is that correct? And is there a... No, the intention is that it works with all versions. Four days, four days running, no new cases, one patient in the hospital, it all sounds pretty promising. How are you feeling?
Oh, it is very promising, and uh, I'm feeling uh, encouraged, as we all should, by that. And I think that uh, then means we're in a good position to provide advice to Cabinet to make a decision uh, next Monday about the, the um, possibility of increasing the numbers in groups. Uh, and, of course, the key thing here is that because, as again, we've had quite high numbers of tests being done of both symptomatic and asymptomatic people, where we just increasingly are confident that there aren't these hidden pockets out there. And that really then does allow us to start thinking seriously about what would a move to Alert Level 1 look like. Advice come Monday then be let's, let's expand those gatherings considering that we're on the front <coughs> of zero cases? Well, the intention was even when the decision was made to go into Alert Level 2 to review that after two weeks. And I think you will be able to infer from the numbers that everything remains promising, remembering that it's not just the time we've spent in Alert Level two, but actually the preceding time in Alert Level 3, so I think all the indications are positive. About the number of, of people that have recovered, so we only, back of, back of envelope maths, um, it looks like we only have about 35 active cases across the country now, did you think we'd be in that position and, and doesn't that back up the move to, to move out of Level 2 and restrictions earlier? Oh, I think it's it's a really good outcome and the, you know, the thing here is that even those active cases are ones from some time ago. So we, we, we are increasingly confident that we have successfully broken that chain of transmission here on shore. And I guess two things from that. One is that's, a, that's a, a, as good an outcome as we might have hoped for from uh, the lockdown and alert level four. And again, we were able to do that for as short a period as possible and open up. It means we can open up more rapidly. I think the second point is that then means we've got a, a, an even stronger focus on ensuring our border is um, very robust in our measures there, but also a focus on how we might uh, put in place the systems and processes that would allow us to start to open that cautiously with Australia and then potentially beyond. Do you think specifically at opening um, more church services earlier than anything else or giving them a special dispensation? Uh, not especially, and I have talked to that already this week. So the aim would be to move as quickly as possible to open up group size for all um, group activities. And of course, uh, church and faith-based gatherings are a really important one, and I know there's uh, a real keenness for, for some of those um, uh, those groups to get together as soon as possible. Well, you can you continue to uh, conduct thousands of cases every day. They all, almost all come back negative. Will there be a point in the near future where the testing volumes will actually decrease just because you'll run out of people to test? So that's a good point. So uh, as we move further into Alert Level 2 and think about Alert Level 1, the testing will, will be still on two, two distinct groups. First of all, symptomatic people, so people with respiratory symptoms. Now we know because of low levels of viruses circulating in the community, there will be less of those now than there might be in a couple of months' time when we start to head into winter. So those people will all be tested. However, we are reviewing the case definition at the moment, our, our um, t technical advisory group, just to make sure it is appropriate for a situation we find ourselves in where we've got um, very low or what appears to be no level of the virus circulating inside the country, but we still want to make sure that we're not missing any cases if, they do, if people do present with symptoms. But alongside that is this other surveillance testing, which is will be particularly targeted at groups who might be at higher risk. So people walking, working at the border in particular, um, you would have made uh, airline, international airline staff, uh, and as well as that, perhaps people working in healthcare and other institutions. It, it, sorry, in terms of the, the tracer app, I just want to ask, has there been any intention to uh, extend it to public transit, which seems to be an area where there's very little contact tr tracing at all? Well, one of the things on public transport now is that um, uh, most of the uh, most of the journeys are taken by people using their uh, a card, some sort of payment card to get on and off. And I know here in Wellington, for example, even though public transport is free at the moment, uh, for example, on buses and, and the ferries, people are still required to use their snapper card to um, clock on and off. So that does provide a record of use of public transport that can be used for contact tracing purposes. Snapper doesn't always require you to give details, does it? Well, your snapper is registered to an individual. It's also not manda mandatory, though, I think. They've said they will let um, passengers on if they don't have a snapper card. Is, would you like to see it made mandatory so you don't have any potential gaps in terms of, of uh, tracing back? 
Well, uh, two things there. One is, uh, yes, I, I understand, and, um, and I've had a family member who's been on the bus, but they didn't have a snapper, and that's, I think, so I think that's helpful. But the important thing here is, of course, uh, if someone is a case or a contact, that they can um, recall where they have been. So what I would imagine is that um, that doesn't leave a gap because people will remember where they where and when they may have travelled over the last few days. In terms of the testing, are, are you looking at doing random testing at supermarkets anymore? Uh, at the moment, we've got a, a, a detailed plan being developed with uh, proper epidemiological advice about the sort of sampling we can and should be doing and where, and so we'll make that plan available next week. That is when we will sort of start to move to this very much more systematic um, surveillance testing. So you're, not ruling, you're not ruling it out? Not ruling it out, no. Please. Auckland's Sorry. Regional Public Health Service has um, said it's going to be a significant challenge mm. for it to meet the government's um, contact tracing requirements. Are you hearing any similar concerns being relayed to the Ministry by other public health units? And if so, is there any additional support for them? Uh, no, we haven't had any other concerns relayed, and uh, Auckland Regional Public Health is our biggest public health unit at serving the biggest population. So, uh, yes, it will be a challenge, the, the scale-up that will be required there, and um, we are working very closely with them, and there is additional funding that the government has signalled will be there to do that. So we're working very closely with Re Auckland Regional Public Health and the other public health units about how they will um, scale up. And there's also, because we've asked them all to put a plan in, they've all got good ideas about how to do that and how to be able to scale up that capability very quickly. Why, why contact tracing for Māori and Pacific? Are Māori and Pacific engaging and has there been any analysis done? Uh, I can't speak to the latter point, but I'm happy to have a look at that. Um, yes, they are engaging, and uh, one of the um, areas we've asked the public health units to look at as they develop their plans and ready to scale up is to... Uh, think about how they can work much more closely with Māori and Pacific providers and communities uh, who will be able to assist with that contact tracing in those communities if required. Is ethnicity data available on the app too? Are you looking for that? Yes, we do ask people to um, record ethnicity so that that will, um, and uh, that just helps us get a picture of who is registering. And then, of course, if, if there is a case and we need to trace contacts, it's very important and very useful for us with our planning and deployment of resources to know people's ethnicity because it help, helps us to target funding and um, service provision into communities that might need it. One more, sorry, yeah, just one please. more. Um, you also have a registration form for Tangihanga on the Ministry of Health website. Are you finding Māori are submitting their funerals in Tangihanga on that? Yes, so the, the registrations are coming through from funeral directors who will be working with um, uh, with marae and so on around Tangihanga. And, of course, we do have some um, dedicated Māori uh, funeral directors. There's a group of those, so they're, they're amongst those who are registering those Tangihanga. It's been um, quite a while since we've had the last COVID-19-related death. Do you expect that we've seen the last of that, or is there a risk of more going, going ahead forward? Uh, that's my great hope, that we have seen the last of those. And as you'll be aware, uh, those deaths have all occurred in people with, uh, in older people, many of them associated with our age residential care uh, outbreaks. Uh, so my hope is that as time goes by, by, those people will have recovered and are therefore unlikely to, to add to our stats there. I should also say that um, over the last few months, um, any, any cases where there's been a, a, an unexplained or sudden death in the community, uh, and that becomes a coroner's case. Uh, in those cases, uh, COVID-19 testing has also been done as part of just checking that we're not uh, missing any cases out in the community, and all those tests have come back negative. Aaron's question about the further, the further question, the testing, sorry. Um, is the, that falls into the category of ongoing sentinel testing, right? That's what would, would, would categorise this. And what sort of scale are you anticipating it to be? Like how many, how many tests do you think will be on, ongoing in that? Sort of uh, I would think for the time being that would be several thousand a day. We would, we would be wanting to do um, quite high levels of, of sentinel testing right across the country. It may be somewhere between one and two thousand, but that will be very much a part of the advice we give to each of the public health units about uh, where they should be testing and how many people they should be testing uh, and for some groups, for example, those working at the, in border agencies, that might require actually just regular uh, testing of the same people. In fact, you might want to test all those people working at the border over a period of time. 
So you said you're going to release this advice next week, but what sort of um, what sort of I guess factors are feeding into it? Like I suppose concentration of previous cases or at risk populations, that sort of stuff. What, what what are the main issues that you're trying to look at, look at? Well, different from the testing we have been doing to date, which has been still testing widely in the community to see if there are, is asymptomatic uh, infection out there or people who may have been infected and are still um, have residual virus. We haven't uh, found uh, any of, of late, as you know. Uh, so different from that, this will be particularly targeted at areas where we think there is higher risk. And, and again, that will be largely around the border, uh, but will also be perhaps people who are working in healthcare settings. And that will be alongside the testing of people who are symptomatic with, with the relevant symptoms. So that, um, populations that, other than sort of work-based work -based populations, are there specific populations that you would be focusing that were more, more high risk? Uh, not necessarily if we're in a situation where we're very confident there isn't virus circulating out in the community. What we will be wanting to do, though, is make sure that all populations have access to symptomatic testing very readily, and that was a big part of our effort over the last few months. So the mobile um, testing, our CBACs out widely in the community. Flu vaccines, how, mu how many are you holding back for uh, those more vulnerable populations? And why are you only recommending that Northern Hemisphere for healthy people between three and 64? Well, well uh, on the first question, uh, we've, we're asking all providers to hold uh, some vaccine back for their, um, for example, older people or pregnant women who they haven't had a chance to vaccinate yet, although we've been seven weeks now since um, vaccination opened up to those groups. We will also be holding back 20,000 doses in our national store to be, um, that can be ordered if, if there are people in those groups. And on the second question, this is because the, uh, the Northern Hemisphere vaccine is a is a good but not full match with the four strains in the Southern Hemisphere vaccine. And so um, we want our people who are most vulnerable to flu to be able to get the vaccine that's got the full four strains covered. And will um, GPs be required to tell their patients which of those vaccines that they're getting? Yes, that will be part of it and, and providing uh, information about what it does and doesn't cover. But again, one of the, the main reason that we went ahead and ordered this vaccine when it was offered was because uh, the specialist advice was very clear. It's, um, it's much better for people to have some protection than no protection, and it will be absolutely useful for and provide you know, good protection for Kiwis who do get that Northern Hemisphere vaccine. Are getting any more of the better vaccine? Of the... Uh, of the, the better... The of the Southern off. Hemisphere vaccine. No, that had all, all gone. It's all um, actually... It's essentially manufactured to order at the start of the season, so we were very fortunate to get those extra... Um, three to four hundred thousand doses we did get ahead of the season. Any final question, questions? Question from a colleague. Uh, at what point do you think it could be safe for non New Zealand passport holders to travel here for that exception to be made, for example, for athletes to come through, do the quarantine process, and come into New Zealand? Well, that's one of the issues we'll now be able to look at if we're confident about how things are onshore. Uh, but, and we are also confident about our border arrangements that we've got good, robust quarantine and, and uh, supervised self-management, um, uh, supervised isolation procedures in place. And then also we are looking at the role of testing uh, in that setting. And we will be moving to testing everybody before they leave um, uh, that uh, even after the 14 days or before they leave self-isolation or uh, isolation or quarantine. What do you need to see for that to be a possibility? Well, we need to be, again, we need to be confident in our border processes and also that there's a, there's a need for people to come in. And I think at the moment it's, it's restricted to New Zealanders and, and uh, New Zealand passport holders or, or permanent residents, uh, but the, the opportunity will be there then to start opening it up. Again, as long as we're con um, uh, confident we can control the risk at the border, that will be the key thing. Do you have any sort of time frame? How soon do you think that might no, be? No, I don't have any time frame. So you're going to test. You're, you're planning on testing everyone, not just from quarantine, but also from managed isolation. That's right. Before they depart from that and uh, and head off to uh, their business. Yep. So that will be one of the things we're doing. Just again, as a as part of that, being really confident, um, we uh, have got everything nailed down at the border. Thank you very much.